Good afternoon, I'm Rick Roush. I'm the Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State, and we are excited to have you all here today to join us for our next College Connections webinar. These webinars are designed to give you a unique inside perspective of the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships within the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. We are recording this session and we'll be sharing it via email with all who registered. You can also find links to all past sessions and registration information for future events on our college website by just searching for College Connections. Today's session is Tricks to Avoid Getting Sick from a Tick. I'm joined by our resident expert, Dr. Erica Mackinger. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A section, first addressing those questions that were submitted during registration and Erica wasn't able to cover in her presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A link, not the chat. That is say, not the chat, as it's easier for us to track them down if they're in the Q&A link. So without further delay, I'd like to take a quick minute to introduce our presenter more fully. Dr. Erica Mackinger is an assistant professor of entomology. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware in wildlife conservation and a master's and PhD in entomology from the University of Florida. Her multidisciplinary integrated research focuses on pests of veterinary concern. She is particularly interested in tick ecology and tick host interactions and incorporates practical applied research questions to try to improve control and personal protection against ticks and other pests. <clears throat> Erica is currently the vector-borne disease team leader at Penn State Extension, where she delivers science-based education to the public addressing human and animal vector-borne disease education priorities. I should add that neither of us is a medical doctor, so we're not providing professional medical advice, such as if you've already been bitten, what kinds of medical pra practices you should follow. So with that, Proviso, uh, take it away, Erica. Super. All right. Give me just a second to get <laughs> this up. Okay. Optimize this for video clip. We should be good. So thank you, Dean Rausch. Um, in this particular shortened presentation, I've tried to address some of the more common questions related to tick bite prevention that I do often get asked. I know there's a lot of interest in this topic. So I've also tried to include additional links and resources throughout this presentation portion to webinars or other external websites where you can explore this information more in depth for those of you that are interested. Um, so like was mentioned, this is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about frantically writing down those um, web addresses. You'll be able to see them um, after the recording is posted. So I'm going to start today is actually on my last slide and I'm going to do this because I find that when a lot of information is delivered, I'll get to the end of a presentation and summarize what I hope everybody has learned. And it can be really challenging for folks to try and remember all of those pieces, those big pieces of what I wanted you to really leave here knowing. So we're going to focus on four main categories. The first is information about ticks that you need to know knowing what increases your risk of tick bites, understanding what tools are available uh, to be tick safer. We're gonna talk, we're gonna highlight some of those. Uh, and then really the most important piece of this is that in order to prevent tick bites, you need to do more than just know what tools are available. You need to change behaviors and implement those tools. So let's start off taking a look at what ticks are of concern in Pennsylvania and the Northeast from a medical and veterinary perspective. So in Pennsylvania, we have about 26 species of ticks that could be found in the state. Uh, about 85% of those actually specialize on a specific animal like a rabbit or a squirrel, or generally prefer to feed on other groups of animals like foxes or coyotes. And there are really only five species of ticks that are of medical and veterinary concern. And those represent about 90% of all the ticks that physicians get when somebody comes in and says, here, I got bitten by a tick. So there are about 10% out there that are not your typical ticks that you may encounter, but really most of them come from these five species. So there are four native species of medical and veterinary concern. These are the brown dog tick and 
deer tick, also called the black-legged tick. Those are the top two in the photos here. And then the lone star tick, which is the bottom left, and American dog tick, which is the bottom right. And you can see that the distribution of these ticks changes a little depending on, on where you are in the state. So if you're in the southern portion of the state, you may see all four of those ticks. But if you're in the northern half of the state, you may only see or encounter black-legged or deer ticks or brown dog ticks. So it does, it, it does influence your risk of uh, tick bites. And so that fifth important species of tick is actually an invasive species. This is the longhorn tick. And I have a the most recent map of the distribution of this tick currently in the state of Pennsylvania, where it's been picked up uh, through various surveillance efforts. And you can see this is primarily in the southeastern part of the state. There are scattered counties in the southwest and central part of the state where we have seen them, uh, but they do pre preferentially feed on hooved animals, so like cattle and not on people, but they have been found on people. If you're not from Pennsylvania and you'd like to see a broader map of where this tick is distributed, there is a link at the bottom here on this slide that does update monthly with where the current surveillance efforts have picked up additional specimens. So we get kind of caught up in tick ID and most folks kind of sit there going, I don't really care, it's a tick, it's biting me and I wanna get it off me. But it does matter what species of tick you have encountered because your risk of pathogen encounter is different based on which tick is biting you. So for example, a brown dog tick, which is all the way to the left here, is associated with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever uh, and Something like a lone star tick, for example, is associated with a uh, tick associated meat allergy, also called alpha gal syndrome, whereas black legged ticks are really our only um, tick that transmits Lyme disease, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So if you're bitten by a lone star tick, your risk of Lyme disease is pretty low. Conversely, if you're bitten by a black legged tick, your risk of, say, um, ehrlichiosis or tularemia is pretty low. So it does matter which tick you encountered. Now we're lucky here in the state of Pennsylvania that the Department of Environmental Protection has a current tick surveillance program in all counties of the state, and they do screen those ticks for pathogens. So for our most common tick in the state, our black-legged tick or deer tick, uh, they're finding pretty consistent numbers in the pathogens this tick carries throughout the state. Um, so adult tick infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease, is over 50%. So it's a 50-50 shot if you're bitten by an adult that you may, um, that tick may have that pathogen. Now juvenile ticks called nymphs will have a little bit less of infection prevalence, but we see that at about 25 to 30% uh, in that population. So the causative agent of anaplasmosis, so that's anaplasma phygostophilum here, is anywhere from eight to just under 13%, and deer tick virus, which has been in the news quite a bit, uh, which causes Powassan uh, encephalitis, is usually at about 1%, although you can see on this map, we have some areas where that was a bit higher because there were some um, surveillance efforts that had 100% infection of ticks found this year, but that was a bit of an anomaly from the surveillance history. So looking at the state of Lyme disease in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania ranks number one in total cases of Lyme disease. And looking at this figure, you can kind of see why that is. So we're that light blue line at the top. And I've put this in comparison to several neighboring states. So Connecticut, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, um, Connecticut not really being neighboring, but a high risk state. And you can see how many more cases per year that we have from those neighboring states. Now we have more people than some of those states and that's fair, but our trend is not the same as those states. So we have seen an increase of cases over time, whereas other states haven't necessarily seen that same increase. So we have many species of ticks in the Northeast. And like I said, it is important to know what they are, but you don't need to memorize what they are. We have help here at the university uh, for that. So if you have a tick that you found, you want identified, you can send a photo or the actual specimen to Dr. Michael Sparla at the Insect ID Lab, and he can provide you with an ID. Uh, I've also put a link at the bottom of this slide here that uh, is a webinar that kind of talks a little bit about tick ecology and way, why we may be seeing some of those changes in tick abundance. 
which does include warming climates, habitat fragmentation, and increasing global travel. So moving forward to risk, basically you need to know when to protect yourself in order to know if you're gonna be at risk. Um, so there are two major components to that. Uh, we need to understand season, we need to understand habitat. And it's pretty straightforward, um, but it does change a little bit. So which species um, or life stage you are likely to encounter does depend on season a little bit. And you can kind of see that here a little bit. So each one of these lines represents a different life stage of the different ticks that I'm showing here. So lone star ticks, dog ticks, and black-legged ticks. Now, most people, if we talk about Lyme disease, most people are at risk of infection in that spring to mid late summer um, part of the year. And that has a little bit to do with the fact that that's when most people are outside doing outside things, but also because our primary uh, vector of that, of the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, the black legged tick, uh, the nymphs are out during that time. Remember, those are the juvenile stages and they're super small. Um, and so most people, when they go to the doctor, they, they get diagnosed with Lyme disease, they don't even remember being bitten by a tick. So it can be kind of hard sometimes to know when you're at risk, but if you know that middle part of the year is when you need to put into practice your tick prevention tools, that can help you. Now, tick bite risk changes a little bit for specific groups depending on your activity. So if you're a hunter, and you're out in the fall, say hunting deer or bear, if you look at those light blue boxes on the edges, that's when you're gonna be out for those, those hunting seasons. And you're really only gonna be at risk for adult black-legged tick bites. The other ticks, you can see those lines don't extend there. However, if you're hunting turkey, spring turkey, you're in that darker gray box in the middle, you've got all three species of ticks and you have all life stages if you're in a region where those ticks are abundant. So your risk does change based on your own activity. And an important point to remember is that ticks are really active year round. So even they're, they're most active at 40 degrees or above, but if you're in the middle of the winter and it's in the 30s and there's a pool of sunshine and some area of the forest, you may have ticks active in that area. This tends to be reduced if there's a blanket of snow on the ground, but it is important to recognize that if you're outside in tick habitat, you're at risk for tick bites. So what does tick habitat look like? Basically, it looks like the woods and it looks like grassy fields. So if you're in the woods, you should be looking at leaf litter, shrubby areas, overhanging vegetation, things that keep the humidity up. You're also looking at places that have taller grasses in fields and ticks can dry out super fast. So they don't want to be in open areas with short grasses with no protection. <clears throat> All right, so now the how-to of tick bite prevention. We have lots of tools and we want you to use as many as you can. So we're going to go through a snapshot of some of the more important tools. There are a couple things we can do. <clears throat> we can have clothing choices that we can consider. We have repellents that we should use. We should be protecting our pets, and to some degree, we can protect our properties. Now, the challenge we face with tick bite reduction is that there's really two approaches. You have personal protection and landscape prevention, but there really aren't any area-wide tick control methods. This is different from, say, mosquitoes where there are. So all of this is very individual driven. So for personal protection, it requires active engagement from you guys, the folks who are, who are listening on this webinar today, to do the things that will protect you from tick bites. Now, implementing landscape prevention can definitely help, like around the house, but there are some caveats that it can get expensive. Sometimes it requires a pesticide applicator. Some options are actually challenging to purchase, and it usually requires ownership or at least permission to do it on a property if you don't own it. So we get asked a lot, so what are some non-chemical ways to help prevent tick bites? Well, these are some easy, cheap, and chemical-free ways. So changing what you wear. If you can wear long pants and shirts, cover vulnerable parts of your body, and help keep that tick away from your skin, that can help reduce tick bites. Wearing light-colored clothing allows you to see the ticks better. Tucking your pants into your socks and shirt into your pants, again, keeps those ticks away from your skin. So those are really simple changes that you can make when you're out in tick habitat. 
You can also treat your clothes with permethrin. So permethrin is a synthetic version of a natural compound that was derived from a chrysanthemum plant. And when you treat your clothes, the chemical binds to the fibers and acts as a toxicant and a repellent for both ticks and mosquitoes. So it's a double whammy. So here's a short video of tick responses to treated fabric. So the pant legs on the left are not treated with permethrin, but the plant leg, pant legs on the right are. And this video is on loop, so you can see it again. So you can see just how quickly those ticks, and I had just put these ticks on those pant legs, how quickly they fall off once they contact that material that's been treated compared to the ones on the untreated legs. So permethrin treated clothing was actually developed for troops in active duty to protect them from mosquitoes and ticks. So extensive studies have been done for those high risk situations in the more public sphere. There have been several studies with folks who have worn permethrin treated clothing out in the woods or out doing their activities and they saw significant reductions in tick bites. 93% reduction in tick bites just by wearing treated clothes. And in another study, they saw three times reduction in tick attachment. So this is a very effective way to protect yourself without having to, to do a whole lot of remembering. You can treat fabric in a couple different ways. So you can purchase commercial, commercially treated clothing, or you can send your own clothes to a company to be treated. If you do that and it's commercially treated, either way, it lasts about 70 washes. But you can also treat clothes yourself, which I don't have on the screen, but you can also treat clothes yourself. And in that case, it lasts about five washes, but you can repeatedly treat your clothes. So it's not just a one, it only lasts five times and you're done. You can do it multiple times. The caveat with treating your clothes is that you follow label directions and you are careful when you are applying it that you do not apply it around cats. Cats are especially um, susceptible to um, permethrin and it can send them to the hospital. So you don't want to do that. Once it dries, it's safe but during application and it's what it is, it is uh, dangerous for cats. So we're gonna transition to repellents. Get a lot of questions about repellents. Um, repellents are chemical compounds that actively keep a pest away. So it may not kill the pest, but it deters the pest in some way. So this is a table that lists the EPA registered repellents for ticks. So these are EPA registrations are ones that are recommended to protect yourself against tick bites. And that registration tells you that they've been rigorously tested and demonstrated to be low risk and effective at repelling ticks. The most common active ingredients or the only EPA registered active ingredients are DEET, Picardin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, IR3535 and 2-undecanone. Now, if you look at a column over that says type, you can see there are a couple different types. There's a synthetic chemical compound. So that does not have a naturally derived source like a plant. That was a compound that was put together, manufactured in a laboratory. And you can see under that and highlighted in this blue box, synthesized, so synthesized plant oils. So these were originally, they're based on compounds that originally came from a plant source, but they are now being synthesized in the lab, the same compound just and made in the lab. Uh, and, and by doing that, they can be better regulated. So if you try and take compounds directly from plants, where that plant grows, how old that plant is, the genetic history of that plant can all influence the, um, the output that plant has. It may not give you the same protection every time. So synthesizing it allows that to be standardized. So at the bottom uh, graph, you can see it says unregistered products. So these are products that the EPA has determined to be minimum risk, but have actually not been evaluated for safety or efficacy, and so not recommended. So we don't know if these are going to actually repel ticks. So I like to get a little bit on my soapbox here and note that I get a lot of questions about essential oils and homemade blends. And as I mentioned, an EPA registration means that not only has that product been tested for effectiveness through a rigorous process, but also safety and risk. So with these essential blends, I don't know if they're effective and they may actually be ineffective and maybe even dangerous if misused. You may come out with 
with skin reactions, um, or you may still be susceptible to a tick bite even after applying them. So I don't recommend them, and I always recommend you um, use an EPA registered product. That being said, I have dropped a link here to the uh, EPA repellent finder where you can put in parameters that are important to you and the EPA has a database where they can tell you specific products that fit in uh, with your um, what you're looking for. So one up and coming repellent I am really excited about is a synthetic plant oil derived originally from Alaskan yellow cedar called Nucatone. Uh, I have a video here that you can see. So we have a, um, a treated finger there on the left and an untreated figure, finger on the right. And you can see the ticks get up to that red line uh, on the left hand finger and do not want to cross into that treated zone where the ticks on the right just cruise on through. So when there's been field testing with this product, we saw a 90% reduction of crawling and biting ticks when participants used Nucatone as a repellent. And this is very exciting. Uh, the EPA recently approved this as a new active ingredient, and we hope to get products on the market as early as this year. And one of the nice features of this versus something like DEET is that this has a really nice odor. It actually smells like grapefruit. Um, so a lot of questions came in about Lyme disease vaccines. Um, so it is important to talk about this. It is not available yet, but there has been significant progress towards a vaccine, another vaccine. And this, there's actually uh, the final phase is currently enrolling study participants. So we may have a vaccine as early as 2024. It's anticipated this will be an annual vaccine given each spring. But the biggest challenge here is that ticks transmit more, more pathogens than the one that causes Lyme disease, although that is a major concern. So we have and the pathogens causing anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, tularemia, alpha-gal syndrome, um, and, and many, many others. And so this vaccine is not going to protect against those other pathogens. So when the DEP announced these really high levels of deer tick virus this year, it really emphasized that the Lyme disease vaccine is excellent and super exciting to have, but it's still going to be very important to use tick prevention, tick bite prevention methods. So last risk factor that I hadn't mentioned yet is actually associated with pet ownership. So a recent study found that just under 50% of pet owners use tick control, but regardless of whether they do or not, um, they're more likely to find ticks crawling on them or a family member in the house if you have a pet versus if you don't. So having a pet definitely increases your risk of coming in contact with a tick. And dogs in particular are great at picking up ticks and bringing them back into the house. There are great methods for assisting with tick control for your pets, uh, oral medications, vaccines, collars, and of course, just your standard tick checks looking for ticks on them. But please keep in mind that just because your animal is treated doesn't mean they won't bring a tick inside. Most of these products require a tick to actually bite the animal to kill it. So if that tick hasn't bitten your dog and it comes inside and that tick falls off, it could then get on you or a family member or another pet. So if you're interested in learning more about tick-borne diseases in pets uh, and tick prevention pets, we have a few webinars that are linked here, as well as an excellent resource in Dr. Haley Springer, who is an extension veterinarian, and I have put her information up uh, at the end of this presentation as well. Okay, so now tick protection around the house. This can get a little bit complicated because we often have conflicting priorities wanting to use the space for recreation, so use our yards, or wild spaces for pollinators or wildlife and staying safe from ticks. So the best thing we can do is just recognize high risk tick areas around our house and implement those tick protection tools in those areas if you're in a high risk season. For example, if you have a play set in the woods, uh, you may recognize that if you are there, or your kids are there, that they may be at risk for tick bites and to make sure you, you do your tick checks. Um, if you have a wildflower garden or it's the fall and you're raking leaves, this may be also good habitat for ticks. So you just want to make sure you're aware of that risk and then you can do the steps you need to prevent it. So probably the most effective way to manage ticks on your property is the use of synthetic caricides, usually pyrethroids like bifenthrin. 
Um, these are highly effective, really effective, with only two early season applications and one late fall application. The negative is that they are toxic to other insects and relatives and aquatic wildlife. So we do recognize that you know, these, these do have a non-target effect. However, natural acaricides um, that folks usually want to go to if they don't want to use the synthetics are not EPA registered. So they are considered minimal risk, but that designation is really only given for people and not to wildlife. So these are plant-based compounds that often have some knockdown effect, but they are also toxic in many cases to other animals and wildlife. So we have to remember that things like arsenic are still natural, but that doesn't always make them safe. So some other concerns are that you have to apply these more frequently than you have, uh, have to apply synthetic acaricides, and we're not really sure how well all of them work. But Western Connecticut University put together a wonderful program called Spray Safe, Play Safe that goes through the pros and cons of synthetic and natural sprays. And I do recommend if anybody's interested in this method of control that you check it out. I put the link down there. But this figure they put together really emphasizes that duration of effectiveness. So you can see the pyrethroids there at the top last about eight weeks, essential oils, those natural products usually lasting only about three natural pyrethrins or maybe a week and garlic it smells like an italian restaurant but it's not going to work to knock down the ticks unfortunately um, there are a couple host targeted methods of control so you're targeting really rodents in this case uh, and tick tubes are one of those ways um, to to address this so tick tubes are um, basically cardboard tubes filled with treated cotton you can put them out around your house Rodents come and find them, they gather it up, bring it to their nest, and they treat themselves with pyrethroids. And the great thing about this is they are compatible with other animals, they're easy to get, like you can buy them on Amazon.com, um, but they don't reach all hosts. So if you have a lot of chipmunks, chipmunks don't look for cotton, and so you're not going to be reaching those animals. But they are great as part of an integrated program using multiple tools to help prevent ticks around the house. So bait boxes are another method of control. Um, these are non-lethal bait boxes. Usually think of those as being uh, attract and kill for, for mice. These are non-lethal. They are compatible with other animals. Um, again, a targeted application of acaricides to chipmunks and mice this time, but they can be expensive and they do provide a food resource to wildlife, which may actually attract animals to your property. So um, we don't know a whole lot about that yet, but it is a concern. So quickly back to the tick tubes for a minute. Uh, we did a study here at Penn State. We've been working with these tick tubes for several years. Um, and basically we, we wanted to see how effective they'd be in a high mouse population. And we put them out for four weeks and we basically reduced the ticks to zero. You can see that highlighted here. So we put them out, we had about four ticks per mouse, which is average. And then we went to no ticks per mouse, whereas our controls actually increased. So when you're in tick habitat, uh, what do you do when you're, in, when you're outside, when you're at home? Um, how do you prevent that additional risk if you may have a tick on you? So here's my secret weapon, and this is a lint roller. So when you're outside, if you're camping or on a longer hike or something like that, bring a lint roller with you and just periodically roll over your clothes and you pick up those wandering ticks before they have a chance to bite you. Make sure you bring a plastic bag though, because some of those larger ticks can wiggle free and you certainly don't want a whole bunch of ticks on you at that point. So you just stick them in a bag after that. When you come indoors, tick check should be the first thing on your mind. It's been shown if you do a tick check within 36 hours, it does reduce your risk of tick-borne disease. Uh, ticks can be anywhere on your body, but you want to focus on the areas where they stay protected, like your hairline, um, under your armpits. Um, places where they it stays warm and they can maybe go unnoticed. A couple helpful hints for tick checks. The first is to know your freckles. So ticks can look an awful lot like a mole or a freckle and it's easy to skip over them. I have this in that top photo there, the tick circle, then you can see a freckle right next to it. The other helpful hint is that ticks can look different on different skin tones, which may make them easier or harder to see. So it can be useful to use your eyes and use your fingers when you're doing tick checks. 
So quick, want to talk quickly about tick removal. If you happen to get bitten, uh, there is a very specific process for tick removal, but it's super easy. So you want to grab that tick as close to the skin as possible with a pair of fine tip tweezers and just pull very gently straight up and clean the tick after removal. Now, a lot of folks try and grab the tick anywhere or try and scare the tick out using heat or cold or a match or smothering the tick in some way. But in reality, what you're doing potentially is causing that tick to regurgitate whatever it's in its body into yours, which may actually include pathogens. And so you really want to try and get that tick out as gently as possible. So you can see in this image on the right, I have circled an area in green, and I call this the no squeeze zone. You don't want to squeeze the tick around the abdomen, which may increase the, this regurgitation risk. So for a live demo, this is a video of the proper way to remove a tick. So you can see two nymphal ticks here. I've grabbed one with a pair of sharp forceps, and I'm pulling very slowly up until that tick releases. Okay, so very simple method. Once the tick is out, you can dispose of it. You can keep it if you want for further testing. I also recommend putting together a tick removal kit that you keep with your regular first aid kit. And this can include a tick ID card, a Ziploc bag or two, uh, forceps. So you don't have to go looking around for them when you have a tick. Um, we have put together, Penn State Extension has put together tick removal kits for humans, pets, and horses. Uh, that includes all of these supplies, and I'm just going to mention with the holidays coming up, these make great stocking stuffers, your birthday presents, or things like that for anybody who lives in a, in a ticky area. Um, so these are available on the Penn State Extension website. So finally, we get down to this. This is our final last slide, and the most important one, this, this last category, and that has to do with behavior. So it's not enough to know about how to prevent tick bites. We have no area-wide management options for ticks and no broad spectrum vaccines for tick-borne disease. So the only thing that will prevent tick bites is a change in behavior to use those tools. So back in the 1940s, the Forest Service started the longest run running public service campaign, which was Smokey the Bear. So I've hijacked that to present Smokey the Tick with the message that only you can prevent tick bites. Research has shown that more than 50% of people don't take routine tick bite prevention steps, even if they know they're at risk. So don't let this be you. Make a commitment to implementing those prevention steps, even if it's just one at a time. So with that, this is a final sheet of resources. Um, I'm hoping we can get this sent around to everybody. Um, but again, this is recorded, so you'll be able to go back and, and jot these down. But they include a lot of um, companies and, and, and folks you can reach out to if you have any additional questions. So I know that covered a lot. I'm going to stop sharing now and we can have we can have a chat about. Well, that's that, that was outstanding and informative, Erica, and you came up with holiday gift suggestions just in the nick of time. So that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think that'll be, be a big hit. So um, so on for the Q&A. So if you want to submit any questions, of course, um, do it in the Q&A box, and, I, and we've definitely got some in. So um, we've got, the first question we have is, how can I best protect my horses against ticks? Oh, that's an excellent question. And it, we have a, an hour-long webinar just on that topic, but I'll summarize a few, a few pieces. Um, so one of the most important things you can do is, is use a repellent. They don't last super long, about 24 hours, but if they're in a ticky area, um, you can keep repellents on. Those are pyrethroid based, and so they are going to have some protection. There are also um, what we call poron treatments, but it, it sounds worse than it is. So things like Equispot, which you can put on and last a little bit longer. Um, one of the things that I always like to recommend to folks to ask their vet about, I can't necessarily recommend it because it's an off-label use. But fipronil is used on dogs um, to prevent tick bites, and it can be used on horses as well, but you have to talk to your vet about it. Um, it's very effective on animals, but like I said, I can't recommend it. I can just say, talk to your vet. Okay, what percentage permethrin solution is appropriate for use in treating clothing? That's an, also an excellent question. So permethrin treated or permethrin for clothing comes in um, a, a bottle labeled for that purpose. 
So you don't have to go out and, and buy a certain percentage. This is, um, and in fact, you don't want to do that. So you don't want to go and buy a bottle of permethrin that's for, say, cattle, or that you can dilute down um, for, uh, for clothes. The permethrin is different when it's sold for clothes. It's specifically formatted and formulated to bind to fibers, whereas the other permethrins are not. So look for a, a product that is specifically for clothing. Okay, great. <clears throat> Can ticks transfer to car seats? Should one treat the car seat with permethrin? So that, <laughs> that's an interesting question. So if you have a tick on you, you can anticipate that that tick could get anywhere, basically. So if you're talking, if you know, talking car seats or booster seats or in your car, absolutely, they can get in those areas. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using permethrin um, for anything that isn't on that label. Uh, so the label is the law. You want to look at that label and see what it's for. You can treat clothing, however. So if you um, look at the label and it's safe for the age range of, of your child, uh, you can treat their clothing and that'll definitely be a, a good protection for you. Yeah, great. So um, Derek asks, you've mentioned Nucatone. Uh, has it been approved by the CDC? Is it a substance that must be used on clothing like per permethrin or can it be applied to the skin? So Nucatone is going to be a repellent, uh, more like DEET. However, they have done some landscape studies with this as well, and they um, may be formulating it as another option, as an acaricide that we can use as a spray, so an alternative to the, to the pyrethroids. Um, and I also will mention that there is some growing interest in formulating it into things like soaps and shampoos as well that will leave, because it does have such a nice odor, that will leave a residual. Uh, the, so you, again, you can take a shower and then go out to a tick habitat. You, you basically already have repellent on you. So they're working on those too, um, but is not being looked at as a clothing treatment yet. Okay. <clears throat> So another question, do you, do you know a book by Chris Newby, uh, Bitten? Um, I, I, maybe this, is this, this may be the one that talked about the government conspiracy with Lyme disease. Is this related to that? I, I don't know. This, uh, oh, okay. Do you have any thoughts about this book? It's hard to give thoughts about it if we haven't read it. So Yes, I haven't read it. I believe that's the one, uh, I believe it's an author who, is trying to make a case that Lyme disease was released um, from a government location. Um, oh. And there's no indication that that is. Yeah. Look, the, the simpler <laughs> explanation is it's been out there for thousands of years. Actually. Yeah. That, yeah. So we usually go with the principle of parsimony or oxymoron. Yeah. Multiple possibilities go with the one that's the simplest. And for most of these diseases, since they're very widespread and so forth, the best thing is they've evolved out there. Um, some ticks are so small, a grain of, like a grain of pepper, um, Charles says, and it's true. They're really hard to spot, aren't they? They are. And so the, a few years ago, the CDC released that photo of the, the poppy seed muffin, I believe, with a tick on it, um, which caused a lot of folks to never eat poppy seed muffins again. <laughs> But yeah, they are very, very small. In fact, when we when we do outreach events, folks are shocked, even if they think they know how small they are. But they are, you know, they're they're the size of a very small freckle. Um, so that's why it goes unnoticed a lot of the time. So Charles continues, is it realistic to do a chick check for these small ticks? And it's like a lot of things that involve entomology. You, just, you get into practice of it and it's, it's not so daunting anymore, right? I mean, it's it's tricky, but you can you can improve your skills by practice. Yeah, you definitely can. I agree. So, um, are there uh, studies about the safety of permethrin treated clothing next to the skin? So, the military has been doing this for 20, 30 years. So, mm -hmm. and I, I think they've studied pretty intensely. Are you aware of what the the um, any kind of safety risks from? Yeah. So. When I, I had, I used to have a slide about this, um, and I do when I talk about repellent specifically in detail, but um, the, I believe, so the EPA's daily dermal limit for permethrin, so that's what you can absorb through your skin, I think it was something you'd have to wear 490 pairs of pants at the same time to yeah. reach the daily dermal limit. Yeah. So yeah, so all of those, those safety studies were rigorously tested for the military, 
and we're kind of the benefits of that uh, by being able to use this as, as a lot of NASA products come down to us, so do, so do the military products. So. Yeah. Um, so what about ultrasonic tick repellents? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so ultrasonic tick repellents work probably as well as ultrasonic deer repellents, which is really not, <laughs> not at all. Or, or mosquito repellents. Yeah, or mosquito repellents. Mouse. Yeah, but this, this has been, again, things in pest management that we've labored on for 30 years. People yeah. keep pu pushing these things out there. And the evidence that they are effective for anything is pretty slim. So Pretty slim, yeah. Unfortunately. Are possums truly tick eaters? I love that question. So this is a great question because, you know, this, there was a study that came out that showed they'll eat like 3000 ticks and the media ran with it, which is great because, you know, we don't want people out there killing possums because they are great in our, in our wildlife, but um, they ate 3000 ticks when they were only fed ticks. <laughs> so that's what they had to eat. And there was a recent study, I believe this year or last year that came out where they actually trapped possums and they took a look at what they were eating and they found no evidence that ticks were a main part of a, po a possum's diet. So they will eat them if they encounter them or likely if they're on their body and they're grooming them off, but they're not actively seeking ticks. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, do we have anything that actively seeks feed on ticks? There's a very small parasitoid that does. <laughs> Uh, it's very rare. Um, the life cycle of the tick doesn't really lend itself to high populations of, of these parasitoids, so they're they're pretty rare, but they will actively seek out uh, ticks and they will kill them. Um, there's nothing that I would consider a true biocontrol, biological control for ticks, where that's what they're looking for, but there's a lot of mortality in ticks. Our mice, you know, we do studies with mice and ticks in the lab, and they eat about 50% of the ticks that we put on them. So, you know, a lot of things do eat them, they just don't actively seek them. Right. So, um, I, I remember a lot of work was done on the, the parasitoids that Eric is referring to are small parasitic wasps that lay their eggs on or in a host and the uh, eggs develop and kill the host. It, whoever wrote the, the Aliens movies had understood parasitology. <laughs> so they, they uh, attack them. They're the, among the most important of biocontrol agents and the least appreciated because they're small and incons inconspicuous a lot. But I remember about 50 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of work done on, on tick mm -hmm. parasitoids and they, they do kill some of the population, but they don't overwhelm it enough to really suppress them, unfortunately. Um, what do tick twisters work as well as tweezers? I don't think I know what a tick twister looks like, Erica. So the tick twisters or tick tornadoes or tick keys, sometimes they're called, um, they often have a kind of a handle and they come down to like a forked area where you scoop under the tick and you can pull it straight up. And CDC recommendations are to use sharp forceps or tweezers, however, especially with animals, these can provide the same level of, you know, you're, you're pulling directly up, you're under that abdomen area. So especially with hair, places with hair, it can be much more effective to use those than it can tweezers. There you go. Um, so, someone else said, yes, it is. <laughs> um, Maria asks, great, it says, great presentation. Any idea why Lyme rates are going up in PA, but not in other states? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that. So, and, and some that maybe haven't been identified yet, but over the past decade or so, there's definitely been an increase in education. Um, so a lot more folks know that they may be at risk and a lot more doctors know that they need to treat. And um, this may have been something, you know, coming from Connecticut where it started, Lyme, Connecticut, uh, where that had been part of the routine. And maybe in Pennsylvania, we were just lagging behind in education and now a lot more folks know and are reporting it. Um, it could very much be associated with these land use changes um, that I briefly mentioned. So habitat fragmentation is great for deer and it's great for mice, which are kind of our two focal species when we talk about Lyme disease. You know, and so we may end up having a lot more activities in areas where habitats are fragmenting and people are encountering ticks more often. But we see this great range shift of ticks happening um, throughout the United States. And with that 
you know, warming climates, you get more acorns, you get more mice. And so there's this whole ecology behind it that's super complicated. It's really hard to pinpoint. Right. Um, uh, Joanne asks, uh, what, do I put, what do I put on a bite after removing the tick? Right. So general recommendations are you, you just wash it, um, but you can put like a triple antibiotic ointment on it. And that's usually good because you're really more worried about the fact that you've pulled the tick out and you have an, an open area of your skin. So you just want to protect that from anything else getting into it. So soap and water is probably the handiest thing. To yeah, do. probably the handiest thing you can do. Yeah. Um, what about birds that could be eating? Because the questions raised about quail or other fowl, somebody else, Bob asked about guinea hens. Mm -hmm. tick control. I get that question all the time, um, especially from folks who own farms where they, they can have chickens and, and guinea hens. Um, so chickens and guinea hens will eat ticks. They eat almost exclusively adult ticks, which leaves the, the small nymphs, the ones that usually are the most problematic to us kind of out in the environment. They're not going to eat ticks where ticks are most likely found, which is the edges of the woods. So they're going to be in the, the pasture areas, the barnyards, the the um, lower grass areas. They're also not seeking out ticks. So they'll if they encounter them, they'll eat them. And by feeding them, you may actually bring in mice and other tick hosts. So they're not recommended. I don't recommend anybody go out to purchase chickens specifically for tick control. But if you have them, it's not working against you necessarily. That, that, that sounds like great advice. <laughs> um, so if ticks do make it into your car, your home for your body, how long can they survive on your interior environment? And I, and I have to say this one, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this one because after a day of spotted lanternfly hunting, I came home, uh, took a shower and then realized there was a tick climbing around the shower stall. After, yeah. and somehow it had gotten home. I don't think it bit me, but somehow it, it must've got home on me and there it was. And there it was. And if it get loose, so that's an example. It definitely got loose in my house. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how, how long can we expect that they would survive in an interior environment? So I'm going to start with the bad news, and that's uh, one of the species of ticks that we have here, brown dog tick, can actually live in your house. So uh, especially in the southeastern United States, they're kind of turning into bed bugs almost, where they can live on, in your bed, they can live in your house and, and do just fine in that environment. Most other ticks don't. They require a really high humidity. It's actually quite difficult to work with them in the laboratory because they need really high humidity. So if you um, if they're in an exposed area and that humidity is not up around 85 plus percent, they're going to dry out pretty fast. Um, so the answer is not long. I can't give you an exact number, but it's not long. Yeah. So, so that that also is a good segue into the, the uh, topics raised by the next question. So Noreen points out the master gardeners tell people not to plant barberry because the ticks love the humidity of the shrub. Plus, it's invasive. It's also food for mice, right? I mean, the berries are food for mice, so. Yeah, and an update um, from Department of Health. Apparently, I guess next year, barberry will no longer be permitted for sale in the state of Pennsylvania, at least, so. Without corn. Yeah. Because <laughs> it is an invasive plant, has been for ages. Yeah. So, but that also brings to mind other things. So, um, as you're really aware, Erica, people have been experimenting with things like controlled burns to take out yes. the <laughs> And where part of the purpose is not so much just to get rid of the ticks that are there at the time by the heat, but open up the canopy, with less humidity. What you think we're hit onto something about changing, you know, where we can do old burns in limited areas, changing the habitat to get less tick friendly? Yeah. So, you know, our this this burn so i brought up smoky the bear smoky the bear was one of the best marketing campaigns but also one of the worst because it turned the public against controlled burns and and natural wildfires now i'm not talking about like out of control wildfires that we see in the west um but there's a lot of resistance to controlled burns even still because of that but it is a very natural thing to happen and very useful in knocking back populations. So I do think there is a, a place for it. Research in that area is really slow because of the lack of resources. So you need burn bosses and you need public acceptance um, to do it. But I do think that it could be very valuable, uh, especially in areas with lone star ticks, which are very aggressive. They seem to be affected by it pretty drastically. So if you, can't, if you don't burn, what about going through and slashing? Yeah, especially if it's weedy invasives. What about just slashing it all down so it 
uh, reduce the humidity in an area? Yeah, so you could reduce the humidity there, but if there's any leaf litter, you're still going to be allowing those ticks to, that's, ticks are in some cases considered soil organisms when they're not actively seeking hosts. So if there's anywhere that they can get under that's sufficient for them, they'll be fine. So it, you can do that, but I'm not sure it would be as effective as, as the burning. Right. Okay. So um, uh, does anap anaplasmosis cause kidney disease in dogs? That's an excellent question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I have the resource to Dr. Haley Springer, who'd be excellent um, to answer that if you want to reach out to her. Um, but you can also ask your veterinarian. I do not know that one. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, it, can you drown a tick if you're in a pool? <laughs> so it depends on how long you hold it underwater. So I'll tell you that when we are when we have our ticks in colony, we they get mold on them, and we have to clean them, which sounds ridiculous, but it has to happen. And so we give them a bath. We put them in ethanol, which is an alcohol, for five minutes, and they're very they're totally fine with that. So if you're going to drown them, it's going to take a little bit of effort. <laughs> so just going swimming will not be enough to clear clean off the ticks. You might no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, do you anticipate fewer ticks during a hot, dry summer? During a hot, dry summer. But so, the the effect on of of rain on ticks is less than you would see with mosquitoes. So mosquitoes really require that water source to develop, whereas ticks don't. They just require some access to a, a humid place. So again, that leaf litter usually stays pretty moist. And as long as that has any moisture in it, they'll do just fine. It's more for them what their hosts are doing, so what deer are doing or mice are doing, than um, kind of those weather patterns. So it's, it sounds like it'd be pretty. It's it would be hard to expect that we could develop a simple model that would tell us on the basis of weather patterns whether it was going to be a bad year, pick year or not. Yeah, I think weather is going to be a part of a model like that, but along with probably 500 other things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's a bit more complicated. It just shows how hard it is to work on these things. Is mulch a good habit, habitat for ticks? I think you've answered that. It, it, it can be because of the soil moisture. Can be, yeah. um, will the video of the presentation later be available online? And yes, it's been recorded. And so, um, well, as I said at the beginning, if you if you go, uh, we'll be sending it by email, a link to by email to all those who registered. And you can always go on to our web, uh, Penn State Extension website and look for College Connections. And um, both past sessions and future events will be there. Um, right, so that's quite a large range of questions we've covered. Uh, um, uh, any last remarks you want to make? It looks like Mary may be dropping some she, links she's into put in the a tick, Yes, chat. If, you go, if folks go to the chat, there are a couple of websites that, that, that um, you can uh, uh, use. Awesome. Yeah, so, you know, my last remarks are, are really, I think I kind of hammered them home in that last slide that, you know, I, for folks who are interested in, in, in taking control and preventing tick bites, it's really just a matter of finding a way to remember to do it and using as many of those tools as you can. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I, I hope all everybody in the audience will join me in thanking Erica for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. No um, problem, this is great. And before, so uh, members of the audience, before you log off, take note of the sessions that are shown on your screen that are upcoming. Um, you, you can't, I don't see how you can possibly let pass by the uh, Berkey, Penn State Berkey Creamery session we'll have in November with uh, Tom Davis. So um, uh, in the sports, the sports surface research will be absolutely fascinating as well. So things are coming up soon. Um, in October, we're jo joined by uh, Andy Bignett, who's the program coordinator of Turfgrass, the Turfgrass Science major. He's a professor of soil science and director of the Center for Sports Surface Research. And he'll discuss the diversity and prestige of our college turf program and his work with high schools and professional sports organizations around the installation, maintenance, and safety factors of both live and synthetic turf surfaces. And uh, as I alluded to, Tom Davis, who, who's the Berkey Creamery manager, and Tim Brown, the additional manager, the additional, pardon me, Jim Brown, the assistant manager, will also provide the inside scoop, ha ha ha, on our uh, Penn State Berkey Creamery. 
and we'll, we'll, they'll talk about cow to cone. And uh, in December, I'll be joined by Josh Rice, who's the Assistant Director of Programs for 4-H. And Matthew Crutchman is an extension educator for the 4-H Youth Programming to discuss the status of 4-H in Pennsylvania and innovative youth programming, promoting physical and mental health and social well-being. So lots of great topics coming up and we hope you'll be able to join us. So thanks again to Erica for a great job, a lot, putting a lot of work into that and uh, ha have a great afternoon, you all. Take care. Thanks.